And there we are. Welcome to the Food Show. I am Andrew Coplino. This is 570 News. We're here each and every Sunday for about an hour. And what we do in that hour is talk generally about foods and restaurants and chefs and farmers and all things that are good to eat. And we try to do that in a lighthearted and entertaining way. Uh, I don't know, I guess sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. But, uh, you know, we always give it the old college try. And, of course, I'm glad that you're able to join me here today. It's a little bit of a cloudy and overcast day, uh, but I still think it's kind of stinking sort of humid out there. And uh, that'll make for some pretty interesting uh, hours, I think, remaining of the Big Kitchener uh, Blues Fest that's going on right now. And um, I'll be interested in hearing from one of our guests a little later in the program um, about how he's found it down there. I'll leave that as a bit of a teaser for you. Also on the show is Scott Rondo of Conscious Food Festival. That's ConsciousFoodFestival.ca. It's kind of an uh, interesting outdoor festival in Toronto that brings together thousands of people and our, the rural neighbors and people that are involved with food production. And it's designed to highlight the sort of connection between plate and planet, kind of a nice little play on words there. That's happening uh, all across the nation, basically. And uh, we'll get a little bit of insight from Scott Rondo about the Conscious Food Festival, and that will come up uh, a little later in the program as well. Uh, getting closer to home, though, uh, Bronwyn Attico of Wordsworth Books will be joining us, too, on the line. She's going to be talking to us about a really interesting and fun, I think, event that's coming up there at the bookstore. Great little indie bookstore that's uh, denied and uh, you know, resisted all the trends to the big box influences. And uh, Wordsworth, of course, an anchor in downtown or uptown Waterloo. And one of the events they're going to be having is called Mennonite Girls Can Cook. And this is an interesting little occasion as well. Uh, I don't know that much about it because I've just come to it quite lately. And I want to bring it uh, to your attention uh, that the idea of Mennonites, uh, Mennonite Girls Can Cook uh, is a blog. It has recipes, hospitality. Uh, it encourages relationships and helping the hungry. And, and it's a book as well. And I guess some of the authors are going to be appearing there to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, at the event coming up on uh, August 13th as well. Same day, actually, as the Conscious Food Festival. So if you want to go out of town, it's the Conscious Food Festival. you want to stay in town, it is the Mennonites, Mennonite Girls Can Cook event that's coming up at Wordsworth. So we'll talk to them later. Now, in my theater, uh, sorry, in my studio right now is a is a, a new a new friend of mine, I guess, someone I've just met in the last little while. I've heard about this organization uh, in the past, and I've I've sort of just got around to looking them up, and I actually bumped into them down at the Blues Festival. The name of the the name of the business is Breadheads, and I'll leave you, leave you a little while to think about what that means. Um, I thought maybe it was a play on the Deadheads that you'd find at uh, at Grateful Dead concerts, but it has a food relationship, and it is a wood-fired pizza uh, organization. Uh, David O'Leary is with me in the studio. Welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Breadheads is uh, breadheads.ca for people to go look at, and it, right. uh, it does have a relationship to, uh, um, I guess, the Grateful Dead and Deadheads in your interest in music. Yes, it's, uh, you know, I played in many festivals across the country and, you know, many bars and barns and that kind of thing, and I was always aware that there was a great lack of food that was going on there. I have a history in food, and, uh, you know, I came across wood-fired um, baking because I wanted to build a mason's oven in my backyard, and one thing led to another, and I ended up... Getting a taking it on the road, taking it on the road, <laughs> and going to the festivals that I used to go to as a musician and as a spectator, and uh, baking wood-fired people for folks. So the background comes out of music, and I guess an interest in masonry or an ability with masonry, or not at all. Not at all with the masonry. I mean, I'm I'm up for any home renovation yeah, project kind of yeah, thing, yeah. and the masonry uh, was something that I was going to lend my hand to last summer. But after investigating it and seeing the time frame that's involved and the money, and uh, you know, uh, I was you know researching on the internet and I came across modular Italian uh, ovens that are imported into the country and uh, so that's the way I decided to go. So it's a it's a music background but not a food one either. I guess you didn't do cooking before this. Well, just, just eating a lot? <laughs> well, eating a lot and when I was 17 years old I had a friend of mine who used to bake uh, um, apple pies in his backyard in, uh, in, in back in Ireland and uh, he, Apple pies in the backyard. Yes. Well, he had a, a, a building out there. It wasn't quite in the open in the open air. But he used to make, you know, a couple of thousand of these things in a week, and he was looking for some help. And he, I arrived there one Saturday morning, and he showed me a pile of dough and a rolling pin, and he said, make 60 <laughs> of these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's oh. how I got started. Well, And it's Kitchener-based, of course. You're uh, yes. both based out of Kitchener. is the sort of the, uh, I guess, the, the hub, and then you radio, radiate in spokes outward to the various festivals and events that you go to. Yes. We, um, you know, we're on Queen Street, and uh, the furthest we went this year is the Winnipeg Folk Festival. 
And uh, last weekend we were at the um, Notre Dame du Nord for the uh, the truck rodeo in Quebec. And the business is uh, based out of just that one uh, idea. Then the the rolling. There's one truck that yes. you take around. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about that. How do, what does it look? How does how does one get a pizza oven attached to the back of a vehicle and cart it across the city? Well, it's, it's um. It's it's simpler than, you know, when I started down this road and the, the, the research for the oven and everything else, I spent a lot of time doing that. But it was it actually turned out to be the simplest part of the whole equation. Um, I mean, you, the, the ovens come into the country, they're shipped in in containers, and they put them together in California, and they insulate them, and they ship them all over North America. So I received mine from, from California in March last year, and uh, we had been in the process of, uh, before we received the oven because we had the specifications for it of putting together a tandem axle trailer to, to mount the thing on. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of help from the from the, the people who had done it before us in, uh, in California, and it wasn't too much of a, a leap of faith, let's say, to do it. Um, but, you know, because it's an, a new and unusual thing and figuring out axle ratios and weight ratios and all of that kind of thing, that was mm-hmm. the only Which is sort of, uh, of some, somewhat uh, distance from actually making a pizza. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. you got to be a jack of all <laughs> trades, right, yeah. I think, you know. Well, tell us a little bit more. In terms of the food that you're preparing yeah. with this oven, uh, we got a stone base uh, yes. in the bottom of it. It's a dome-shaped thing, yeah. and into which you chuck logs, uh, start yeah. them on fire. The, the fire temperature goes up to probably nearly, what, 800, 900 yeah. degrees, yeah. and in goes the pizza. Um, how do you develop a recipe? How did you find out what, what sort of works in there, what doesn't? Um, what are the logistics behind the actual food preparation? Um, I guess there's a couple of things in there. Uh, I went out to California, and I, I there was a, a gentleman out there that I went out to see, and he was VPN certified from Italy, so Vera Pizza Napolitana. He knew how to re- make the, the real deal Naples pizza, and mm. uh, he showed me what to do. So after I came back from California then, and I, I had my oven, and I had the knowledge, now I had to put together where I was going to source my recipes and, and get mm. all of my ingredients from. So I wa- wanted to keep it as local as possible. And uh, that's what we set out to do. But we do make compromises because if I can find a, a, a better t- t- tasting tomato sauce that's not local, well, then I'll use it because I want my product to be as good as it can be. Sure. Uh, so I, I try to stay as close as I can to a traditional wood-fired Italian pizza. But I obviously have to make the compromise, compromises because we're not in Italy, you know. No. Uh, so that, that, that's the way we set about it. So we use, um, we use a San Marzano tomato. It's a sweeter tasting tomato, and it's it's a sweeter tasting tomato because it's grown in the Cambria region in Italy. And these are uh, tomatoes uh, as some wines or wines that are are sort of protected by their origin. That's right. Origin there. They're well, a I, more distinctive in that way. They are. I mean, they're, 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 the ones that we use are not DOP certified because if they were, we'd have to pay you know ten dollars more <laughs> yeah. for a can of them yeah. Yeah. and charge it thirty dollars for a so pizza say, rather yeah, than yeah. ten dollars. Yeah. Um, so and again, that's a kind of a compromise that you have to make, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it is a sweeter tasting San Marzano tomato, uh, even though it doesn't have the DOP uh, distinction about it. And the same with our cheese as well. We use a full fat mozzarella, and traditionally in, in Italy, you'd use the uh, buffalo's milk. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but because I mean, you just can't get it in the quantities that we need. If uh-huh. we go away to a festival and I'm looking for 200 kilograms of cheese, I'm not going to be able to get that. So. The closest thing that we can get to it is a full-fat mozzarella as opposed to a partly skimmed. Um, so you, you taste the creaminess of the cheese, the sweetness of the tomato, the freshness of the basil on a margarita pizza, and the crispiness and uh, just the freshness of, of the bread. I mean, Breadheads is a play on, on the Grateful Dead thing because we, we like to stick to music festivals. But pizza is a lot about the bread. Right. And people have gotten far away from that. In every other you know corner pizza shop out there, the, the bread... It, it, it's not something that, that I think, you know, complements the food at all. Um, so, yes, it's it's a play in the Grateful Dead, but it's also, it's all about the bread for me. I'm speaking, of course, with uh, David O'Leary of Breadheads, breadheads.ca. You can uh, check out the pizza oven uh, right down below this building right here, over across at the park, just off of David Street. You'll see uh, a whole bunch of stuff. That's where you're located, right? Yes, yeah. yes. You'll find a whole bunch of uh, food activity going on there, and one of them will be uh, um, the breadhead, guys. Uh, well, just sticking with that bread for a moment, um, pizzas uh, have gone a route that I think, unfortunately, is one of these heavy, doughy, cheesy things yes. in the chains. Um, <laughs> yes. And your pizzas, though, are more, I, I don't want to say cracker crust, because that's right. almost a little too much, but yeah. they are the thin, thin crust, that's right. and that's what, what, what I think is your specialty. Yes, we use a six-ounce dough ball to make a 10-inch pizza. And we do keep the, uh, the, 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 the perimeter of the, of the pizza. It definitely has a more of a softer, bready texture to it. But where we actually put the tomato sauce definitely is a thinner crust and, and has that 
uh, cracker flavor to it, but not as dry as a cracker. Yeah, and it's got a little bit of that nice charring that happens That's right. from the base of the oven. Yeah, there's a lot of people, you know, when we pull them out of the oven, and if they haven't had a wood-fired pizza before, they take a little, you know, yeah. a peek at it, and, you know, they might say it's it's burnt or, or something like that, but it, it, it's part of the essence of what wood-fired baking is all about. Uh, you know, and I actually carry a picture around with me of uh, Mario Batelli's cookbook where he has a pizza <laughs> on the front of it, and it's burnt to a cinder, in, in my opinion. But I show people and I say, look, if this guy can get away with it, well, then, you know, I can too. Is, is this is the proof you're showing if someone says, yes, what is this? It's that's all right. flat. didn't yeah, rise. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know, in, in the business, they call it leoparding because it has that patchy churn. Leoparding. Leoparding. Oh, leoparding. Oh, nice term. So before we haul it out of the oven, we, we use the blade to look underneath the pizza. And if it doesn't have that leoparding, then it's not cooked. Uh-huh. And the wood fired baking, it cooks, cooks it from the three ways. You have the, the radiant heat coming off the floor, the direct heat from the fire that we constantly turn the pizza on, mm-hmm. so we're charring the side of the pizza. And then when the flame licks over the dome at the top of the oven, that's what's cooking it on top. And we're and talking like in like two minutes or less. Two minutes or less, yes. These things just fire up right away. They do. Yeah. They do. Um, just thinking of the time here, we should take a break soon, but before, um, oh, how much fun is this? It's more fun than because everybody wants to make pizza i think there's the whole That's romantic right. kind of throwing yeah. it up in the air yeah. and all that kind of yeah. stuff but yeah. i know you're probably got to do a little bit more quickly than that yes yeah that. we don't have time for that must be a lot of fun it is a lot of fun you know and it's it, if you can find something that you're passionate about it's not work at all and it's just that we, we love doing it we love traveling the country and we love making pizza for folks and and you know educating people about the you know everything that's wonderful about wood for it baking and uh, we should point out that uh, you'll be there for the remainder of the day. Yep, remainder of the day. So there's lots of time for people to come and try yes. the pizza. Yes, come on over and say hi. Well, we, can you stick around for just a moment? Absolutely. Okay, because I want to ask a little bit more about the Blues Festival per se for me from a, a foodie musician's uh, yes. perspective. <laughs> I'm speaking with David O'Leary, Breadheads, breadheads.ca, and right down at the Kitchener Blues Festival in Victoria Park, just off, side of, off the side of David Street. I'm Andrew Coppolino. This is The Food Show. It's time for a short break uh, when we come back a little bit more about Breadheads. This is 570 News. And, up with me. and we're back again. This is the second segment of the Food Show. I am Andrew Coppolino. Thanks for staying with us. And uh, we're talking with David O'Leary, Breadheads, breadheads.ca. Great pizza oven. I've had one of the margaritas. Yep. Which is, to me, the classic. I mean, if you yes. can pull off a margarita, then I think you've got pizza. Yeah. I look for the tomato tomatoiness. I look for, I don't like heavy cheese on the pizza, and it's nice that that's sort of dappled, I guess, with the mozzarella, and then, of course, the basil, and, you know, the history of the margarita. Do you yes, know, of course. Know, yeah. the, the, the romanticizing yes, of it. Yeah. Uh, but it's a good story, anyway. About it's a great story. Yeah. Why don't you tell it? Well, the history of, of the margarita pizza, um, she was a princess consort, I think, in the 1600s, and... Uh, they wanted to make a, a food, I guess, to commemorate her, and they went with the Italian flag. So on a margarita pizza, you've got the red of the, the, of the tomato, mm-hmm. and you have the creaminess of the cheese is the middle of the flag, and then you have the green of the basil, and that's where it comes from. There you go. So and told so, told so much nicer with a man with an Irish lilt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is multicultural. It's not its best. An Irish guy selling well, Italian food in Canada. I was going to try to do it with an Italian accent. Yeah, it just doesn't right. sound the same. That's right. But um, yeah. oh, where is it? Armagh or Inniskillen? Where are you from? Dublin. Dublin. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. James Joyce country. That's right. <laughs> One of my that's faves. Right. Um, I don't know, would he, would he be a pizza fan? I know, I think he's more of a fish and chip head. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Guinness. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what else is on the menu? I think that uh, people should uh, be tantalized, tease them a bit. Well, we, we run, typically at a festival, we run five pizzas. We have a margarita, as we just described, and then we do a pepperoni, and um, it's the tomato sauce, the cheese, and, and pepperoni. And we have a Hawaiian, uh, not something that, you know, this is, you know, the, the fine line we walk between the tradition and what people expect. And trying to find a local pineapple is a killer, yeah. I bet. Well, <laughs> you know, we use fresh pineapple. I, I, will, I will say so, that is okay, distinct yeah. from something that comes out of a can. Yeah. Uh, we and that harkens back to you know trying to use the freshest stuff that we can. But, get. but it's a balance for any business, isn't it? To try it really to is. find uh, you know this is what I stick to in terms of my principles and philosophies and what I believe that we can pull off with you know the marketing and you know 
being able to give your customers what you think they want. Yes. It, it is a bit of a balancing act. There's no doubt. It really I mean, is. You have to. I mean, every restaurant I've ever gone into, I don't know why they still have it on the menu, but they have Caesar salads on the menu. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just every time I see it, I laugh. Or grilled salmon. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so many grilled salmons out there, but people like it. People, That's it's right. a safe choice. If they don't know what else to get on the menu, you have to give them that choice. Well, and you know, at the end of the day, it sells. And if you take an operation like ours on the road, I mean, if you travel halfway across the country to be at a festival, it, you know, I can go along there with anchovies for a pizza because it's tradition, but I won't sell a whole lot of them. And uh, as I say, that that's the, the fine line that we walk. And changing recipes is difficult too. If you're going to add something, mm. you have to test it and you have to run it and see, make sure it run, you know, make sure it works well with the pizza and that yeah. you can pull it off and be consistent every time. Yeah. Well, when we're at home, we we experiment a whole lot with it because we fire up the oven at home base as well, and we'll put a uh, balsamic reduction with walnuts and blue cheese on a pizza, and it's it's an outstanding pizza, but mm. yeah. and it's not something that people could go for at a festival. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, you know so we it's it's we try and provide what people expect, but then we, our spin on it is is that it's it's a baked traditionally, and we use the freshest ingredients mm-hmm. that we can get. Now, what if you're going to something like an organic f- food festival uh, or some place where there's a real heightened awareness of food? You know, could you change at a moment? Say you're going to do like a a pizza that's topped with organic herbs or oregano or or, 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 or arugula or something. You know, sure. you might have sort of a warm pizza that way sure. or a warm uh, salad on top of your pizza. Can you adapt that quickly if, if you know, charting out, well, the, the medieval fair that you're going up to, would you have like wild boar or something on it? I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Probably not, but all of our pizzas are, uh, all of the dough is made with Canadian organic wheat, organic sunflower oil, water, yeast and salt, and there's nothing else in there. Uh, so without making any claims for it, if we're already organic on our base to begin with. Um, and, you know, if, if we're going if from our suppliers, when we are choosing our ingredients, if there's an option for organic or not, we're, we're getting the organic. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily even something that we advertise when we're out on the road, but it's just our philosophy. It's something that we believe in. It's something that we try and stick to as close as possible. You can't do it all at the time. Right, I mean, you've right. got to bend. If I'm on the road in Winnipeg and I run out of something and my local supplier is, is back in Kitchener, well, then I got to go somewhere else and get it, and I can't always get what I want. Uh, but because we're aware of it, and because we 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 lean towards it all of the time, we're constantly looking in that direction. So, in my opinion, it makes for a better product. Well, let's flip to the other side of the pizza peel and sure. uh, ask you a little bit about your impressions of the blues uh, festivities that you've seen down there. The music, your music. Do you play the guitar? Do you play? I do. I played. A, I played uh, with a band called Hair the Dog, or a Celtic band, and uh-huh. you know we traveled around, and I, I fronted the band and played guitar and and the Beuron and a little bit of harmonica. And um, so, you know, my interest in festivals is not just providing food. I mean, I could definitely go for the music. And if we can set up in a field and and, and make pizza for folks, and if the stage is right there, I am just... That's like the best of both worlds. That's my happy place. (laughs) It's a fantastic thing to do. Um, And the Blues Festival is fantastic. I mean, first of all, it's free, which is just amazing, apart from the Greg Allman show. But a festival has to support itself. So if they charge in for one big headliner, I think it's a a fair trade. Uh, but the music is just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the, the production from, again, a local company, you know, Sherwood Systems, uh, the sound is fantastic, you know, and uh, it's it's just a great place to be. In all of the festivals, I mean, you were just out at the, uh, oh, I don't know, what was it, the Folk Festival in Winnipeg and the, and the Jazz Festival. Um, in Waterloo. How, do, how does this compare on scale? Like, is this, uh, as far as you know about blues, I've heard mm. that it's one of the biggest in the country, if yes. not the biggest. Is that... Does that make sense to you? Does that you see where that can line up? Or? Uh, I, I I think that the claim that they make is that it's the biggest free one, and oh, you okay. know, who's to say? I mean, I have to say when we go to a lot of these festivals and you look on the on the web page and they say that they attract X amount of people, I have never been in a field with you know uh, that many people kind of thing. I think that we did a show in Bob Cajun uh, with the Tragically Hip, and there was um, I think twenty five thousand people there. And when you're standing there looking out at the field, it's hard to imagine, imagine that that's yeah. twenty five thousand people. So if they say that they get 100,000 at a festival, and I'm thinking four times that crowd, that's a really hard thing to, to fathom. Certainly over the course of the four days through Kitchener, you could certainly see that amount mm-hmm, of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're, they're certainly not in, all in that spot at the same time. <laughs> of course. Uh, do you have a favorite, favorite performance so far? Well, one of my favorite <laughs> albums is uh, The Last Waltz by the band. And when they did uh, that tribute show in the park, I had to you know, go over to the stage and make sure that it wasn't actually the members of the yeah. band over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it was just note for note, it was just absolutely wonderful. How wonderful. many pizzas have you gone through, do you think? Can you estimate? Uh, we're, we're probably somewhere around four or 500. I haven't done a final tally yet, but 
you know. And tell us where you're coming up to so people can maybe uh, find out where you're going to be in the next few weeks left of the summer um, and where they might be able to bump into breadheads. Where are we going to be? Uh, upcoming shows, we have the Busker Fest in Waterloo. Uh, we August have, 25, I believe. Yes, yeah. the dates are all, all in all my fuzzy? head somewhere. They're all, yeah. all, They're all, all fuzzy. fuzzy. Yeah. That's why I have an iPhone. I keep checking into it. <laughs> uh, we're going to be at the Royal Medieval Fair. That's another one in Waterloo. And um, Southside Shuffle in, in Mississauga, uh, well, in Port Credit, I guess they call it. And that, that looks like a pretty decent event down there as well. A lot like the Blues Festival, you know, a lot of blues and jazz artists down there. And then I think something called the Eden Mills Writers Festival. Eden Mills Writers Festival. Eden September Mills September is a, September. yeah, it's a fantastic event. It's, a, it's not, you know, there's not a lot of people who go there, maybe a couple of thousand people, but it's a little hamlet of a town. And it's just, it, there's no music at all. Uh, mm. It's all just writers, author, authors, independent folks who just set up a tent and, you know, talk about their books and, and things that they've done. But it's a, just a, we love doing it. We did it last year and we're, yeah. we're looking forward to going back. And wax poetical on the pizza. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> right. Well, thank you for joining me, David. I appreciate that uh, you took the time out of a day, that, of a weekend that's pretty busy yes. and an important one. I think it's uh, it's good to make the connections with the population out there. And I it hope is. that I hope that uh, we'll be able to see you more and more Great. Uh, around the country. Uh, best wishes. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's David O'Leary, Breadheads, breadheads.ca. And please check out the, the Blues Festival as well for its remaining hours here today in downtown Kitchener. And you can... Find your way over to the uh, park and get uh, some great uh, some great pizza and other great food that's there as well. Well, we do have to take a brief break. Uh, when we come back here on the food show, we're going to be talking to Scott Rondo of the Conscious Food Festival. I'm pretty interested in what exactly this means, uh, and I hope you'll join me when we come back. You're listening to 570 News. Monday morning on the Jeff Allen Show. Do you have questions about me, the show, the staff, or the station in general? Well, if you do, get your questions ready for Ask Jeff. My special guest is our boss, Pete. So if you want to know why the signal's been funny, all you have to do is call in and ask. Make sure you are listening to the Jeff Allen Show. Weekdays from 9 till noon on all news radio. 570 News. Also broadcasting live on Rogers TV Cable 20. News. And welcome back once again to the Food Show. This is our third segment. Time just flies when you're having fun with food. It was great talking with uh, David O'Leary of Breadheads and uh, all the great stuff that's happening down at the Blues Festival. Now... I have uh, come across this website. It's called Conscious Food Festival, and it's uh, a festival that's uh, the first and only outdoor festival in Toronto, and it brings together thousands and thousands of people, rural neighbors and visitors to Toronto, to experience a range of activities that highlight the connection between Earth and our plates, between planet and plate, as it were. Uh, This event takes place on Saturday, August 13th, and Sunday, August the 14th, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on there. Now, we're trying to get a hold of Scott Rondo. He's the uh, event manager and the founder, uh, co-founder of the uh, the organization. He's on the line now. Scott, how are you there? I am here. Great to have you here. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. It's Uh, it's the festival. Next weekend, you know? Yeah, it's the festival season, isn't it? There's a lot of stuff happening, and one of the things we try to do here on the Food Show is uh, bring our viewer, our listeners, and our viewers, uh, if they're watching on the internet, live on the internet at 570news.com, is bring them uh, local events, but also events that are within, you know, a few hours uh, or an hour or so traveling. And that's why I thought I'd talk to you today about the Conscious Food Festival. Maybe you could just give us a little bit of background. Um, as to what exactly the Conscious Food Festival is and what, I guess, Conscious Food is. Yeah, no problem. Well, I mean, there's a lot of foodies out there, as you know. I mean, your show, uh, it it caters to it, uh, to them. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, I guess, saving the planet. But I guess, you know, if if you said save the planet, it's like, well, how? How do you save the planet? So we kind of thought, as foodies, it's a common goal. I mean, short of breathing air and drinking water, which are all important things, obviously, about cleaning our planet. But the common goal we, we all share is eating. Everybody does. Every mm-hmm. living thing shares that. So we just kind of felt, you know, originally it was called the Green Food Festival, and then we kind of felt that green was overused, maybe underdefined, more importantly. Anybody could say they're green. But con- the word conscious for us was about education. So we just basically want to, um, y- you can come to the show and be well-educated and well-fed with delicious food and, and learn and learn all about how you can eat, you know, locally is better, and you can eat sus- uh, sustainable food is a lot better, um, why organic is better, uh, why you should eat less meat, and if you eat meat, it should be better meat, all kinds of things. So there's all kinds of programming on the site um, all weekend long for uh, the whole family, actually. We've got we're doing 
kids programming. Um, we're doing uh, making your own ice cream. Uh, we're doing um, uh, vegetable and fruit, local vegetable and fruit bingo. Uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Pl- how to plant your own garden for kids. All kinds of rolling your own oats. You name it. And, and we've got competitions with um, uh, with a bunch of uh, um, I guess chefs. Uh, that are that are on site and they're going to do. A, we have a um, a veggie sandwich uh, competition judged by butchers, which is kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing um, uh, we're doing donuts judged by cops. <laughs> we're doing uh, and a lot of the. A lot well, of hey those, Scott, I'll I'll refer all the calls to you then. Yeah. I'll complaint then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So and there's a bunch with local ceviche smackdown uh, sponsored by Oceanwise, which is all about sustainable. Um, you know, sustaining our oceans and 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 doing what's uh, responsible. So they. So they survive. Tell us a little bit about. I mean, I know one of the one of my favorite fish shops uh, is going to be there, Simple Fish and Chips. It's in located in Stratford, which yeah. comes clear across uh, uh, Kitchener and Waterloo here on on, on its way to uh, to your festival in in uh, Toronto. Uh, what are the, some of the other food vendors that are going to be there, and how, as a customer or a, a visitor to the to the event, would I buy their food? Is it come in little cups? Do you buy tickets? Is there? No, a- absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Basically, you show up at the show. If you if you buy your tickets in advance, they're only I think they're twelve fifty online. Plus the 250 service charge, so it's a good, a good um, incentive to buy in advance. If you buy at the gate, it's 20. dollars mm-hmm. um, Again, that includes all the programming and uh, some free samples, live music, entrance to the park, uh, museums, all that kind of thing. Um, and then you pay as you go, so you buy little sample vouchers, much like you know the wine and cheese or the gourmet food and wine or the beer festival, these types of things. Right. Um, and you buy they're they're worth a dollar, and you you know samples range from a uh, dollar to say five dollars. And it depends on what you get. You might get a che- uh, plate of cheese, you know, for four or five dollars, and then you get a little sample of wine for one or two, or a little sample of beer for one. And uh, and you walk around and you and you know and you speak to the you know the chefs and the farmers um, who are on hand, and they can tell you why their why their products are, are better for you to eat uh, for a number of different reasons, as I mentioned before. You know, so um, as far as restaurants that are going to be there, well, you name Simple Fish and Chips, that's great. They're actually part of an ocean-wise pavilion, um, all about uh, you know saving our river and lakes and and uh, you know making sure we eat responsibly um, so they survive as I said and in we've also got Pangea in there uh, we've got um, uh, Hooked which is a, a brand new and Toronto's only um, I guess it would be a sustainable fishmonger uh, in Leslieville here in the East End in Toronto um, and then we've got uh, uh, the Fish Bar which is a new restaurant on Ossington just opened up about three months ago it's awesome Chef David's coming from there uh, Marbin would be uh, one of our one of our restaurants down on uh, Wellington Street. They're great. Um, we've got uh, geez, we've got about twenty plus mm-hmm, chefs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, so we're really we're really excited. I could, uh, the Grindhouse is there. Uh, chef Rodney, who's a new celebrity chef, is going to be there. Um, you know, I could I could list all twenty probably. It yep. might take me a few seconds. <laughs> I'm speaking with Scott Rondo, of course, of the uh, Conscious Food Festival, ConsciousFoodFestival.ca. Uh, where is it located? Where do we go? Yeah, so uh, as you said, ConsciousFoodFestival.ca is our site. Um, you can, it's uh, at Fort York, so Fort York National Historic Site. It's great. As I mentioned, museums are open. Fort York's actually doing, it's really neat, I saw the cookbook the other day. Um, it, the cookbook is dated 1806, and they're serving um, food that would have been served to the officers, not rank and file, that's important, because they probably got, like, yeah, <laughs> soda bread and, hard tech and, you know, like, yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. bad stuff. But they're doing, um, they're doing a vegetable pudding that's, that would have been fed to the officers back in 1812 uh, on site, and they actually um, they actually have a, a garden on site that is uh, evergreen. Helped them, uh, s- uh, I guess, um, source uh, vegetable strains that would have been as close to what they would have actually ha- been growing on site. Because everything would have been sustainable, right? You would right. have grown your own vegetables in the summer. You would have, uh, you know, um, preserved you know, them, all, all that kind of stuff, and then preserved them over the winter and. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, uh, just before we, we finish up here, uh, th- how long has the event been going on? Is this what year are you in now? This is our second year. Okay. So we were really happy to do it last year, and it was a big hit. And I think, you know, this is a real to- hot topic right now, and I think it's an important one, as I met, set off the top. You know, I think if, if everybody just eats a little, like Local Food Plus is one of our partners, and, uh, you know, they say, you know, if, if everybody just spent $10 a week c- focusing on buying local product, um, it would, you know, be better for the local economy. It would, it would help our farmers, especially in your region, which is some of the best farmland in the world, mm-hmm. um, you know, survive. And we would have better tasting food. You know, you, you know, by design, if foods travel from, you know, say you import a peach from California or Oregon, um, you know, uh, it's, it's imported, so you're, you're hurting the plant a little more because, it, it, you know, it traveled across, 
you know, whatever, 3,000 mile, whatever the distance is. Right. But also, um, uh, because it travels, it's a type of peach. It won't be called what I like to call a sink peach, which is a nice, juicy Ontario peach you eat over the sink because it's so <laughs> juicy. But because it has to travel, it's a little harder, it's, you know, um, and it's just not as a good, of, good a peach. So there's a number of reasons to eat local, and Local Food Plus has these great stats. If you go to their site, local food, localfoodplus.ca, uh, they have a wh- whole bunch of stats on if everybody, like say if 100 people spent $10 a week over the year, and like it, it's the equivalent to taking two cars off the road, it's the equivalent, or three cars off the road, it's equivalent to like 100 jobs, you know, the domino effect. And So imagine if 100,000 people did that, and let's say they spent 100 bucks a week instead of 10, like we would be really doing uh, justice for our local economy, our, our, our sustainable food systems, all type, and great for farmers, and that's important for, again, for uh, for uh, for our our economy and and uh, and whatnot. You uh, you mentioned this shows uh, the the festival is only in its second year. Uh, yeah. Could could you have imagined this kind of thing happening? Five years ago, even at the at the level at the scale that you're on right now. Yeah, yeah, I know it grew pretty fast. We were pretty impressed with our, our first year turnout. We're expecting to double this year, um, but you know, it's hard to say. To the, actually, what what I find most interesting, and I was just talking to my father about this on the weekend, um, is. You know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I didn't know a lot of these things. I've been learning as I go. Um, you know, I you know I had thought you know local. I was reading the hundred kilometer diet, and I was a foodie, and I was an event organizer. And I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a green food festival. It's all about local. Mm-hmm. But I realized that there's a lot of of, of things. There's a lot of uh, you know things you have to navigate when you're buying. You know, do I buy organic? Do I buy local? Do I buy you know uh, whatever? You know, um, hormone free meat. Do I buy you know all these things that you have to navigate as a consumer. Um, and so it's really neat, actually. I, cu- I couldn't really fathom where we'd be right now, mm-hmm. I, I got to say, or, you know, especially five years ago, because I was a foodie, but I didn't necessarily, you know, I bought, I didn't think about where it came from. I just, lo- I, I thought about taste. I might have thought about organic, but I didn't think about where it came from. And I think that's an important thing for people to realize, and so that's what we want to do. We want to educate, you know, so people can make their own informed decisions. Well, inform us uh, and educate us about uh, the website, uh, the dates of the program, uh, of the event, and uh, where people can get more information and all that kind of admin great so uh it's again consciousfoodfestival.ca um we our tickets are for sale at ticketbreak.ca but they're they're also um uh, there's a hookup on that website uh, that i mentioned our website it's august 13th 14th so the times on saturday next weekend are from 11 until 8 p.m and on sunday are from 11 until 6 p.m and um there's plenty of parking down there uh but you know we if if you're uh, if you're local of course we always say to to take the ttc or if you're coming from out of town carpool and that's a b- better for the environment ride your bike whatever but uh, your listeners may be from a little further away um, but uh, yeah and you know there's like I said there's about 20 plus uh, restaurants and chefs uh, lots of programming we've got uh, a couple of local breweries craft breweries we've got uh, three wineries we've even got a local vodka um, and it's, it's, you know not to <laughs> I'm looking forward vodka. to that Pardon me? I'm looking forward to that <laughs> yeah 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 and, and not to flip right from the booze to the kids but it's yeah, family okay. friendly it's all ages uh, we have real food for real kids and Everdale are, are partnering with us in our kids zone and we're doing all kinds of great things um, there's all kinds of stuff to do so if, if you're looking for something to do that's family friendly but you can you know um, try some great food and maybe sample a few uh, different uh, libations if you will um, th- this is the place to be for the weekend and uh, you know we're looking for good weather and it'll be great but it's all covered I should say that it's, it's all, all covered, covered. there's tents everywhere and there's indoor spaces so um, Scott even- that's, that's a great uh, uh, that's a great event and so I want to thank you very much I've got to go to the next uh, no worries, the next segment, great. but thank you very much for giving us the the lowdown on it. Uh, right. Sounds like a great organization, and I'm hoping that uh, the weather is very fine for a great and fine event. Cheers! Thanks so much. Thank you, thank Bye you. Now. That's Scott Rondo. He is uh, from the Sl- uh, sorry Conscious Food Festival that will be held at, at uh, Fort York Historic Site on uh, August 13, 14, and um, I hope you'll uh, take a look at their website. Um, uh, consciousfood.ca and learn more about it. Now, a local event that has much of the same kind of uh, stuff happening is uh, the Taste Local Taste Fresh 2011. It's Food Link's annual, and that's 8th annual, culinary showcase and fundraiser. It runs September 18th in St. Jacob's. Great restaurants are paired up with great farmers and producers, and uh, it all happens um, for about $65 until August 31st. After that time, you got to pay a little bit more, $75. But uh, check it out, September 18th. Well, you can tell by that music, it means only one thing, and that is that we have to go for a little break here. Uh, This is The Food Show. We'll return and we'll talk to the Mennonite girls who can cook. This is 570 News.
This is the Food Show with Andrew Coppolino. To call Andrew, 519-570-2545. By cell, star 570. Or toll free, 1-800-570-5715. And here we go once more. Last time, last segment. Glad you're still there with us. Uh, we've got one last segment, and uh, it should be an interesting one. Uh, I think people who live in this region uh, know a little bit about um, Uptown Waterloo's great bookstore, Wordsworth Books. It's part of our social fabric, as it were, I guess, when it comes to sort of uh, books and um, reading materials. And uh, great to see that they're uh, still producing some great events. Uh, and couple that with our knowledge and what our knowledge is and, and what we, we th- are thankful for in our Mennonite tradition as well. Now, Wordsworth has put together those two things, their own great stuff at the bookstore, and an event that's called Mennonite Girls can can cook. Now, of course, when I see those two words, cooking and Mennonite, in one sentence, it always gets the taste buds, uh, you know, sort of salivating away, and uh, I'm, I'm getting pretty hungry just talking about uh, what might be, uh, you know, at the other end of this event. And to join me, uh, to joining me to help me talk a little bit about this is um, Bronwyn Attico. She's with Wordsworth Books. Hello, Bronwyn. Are you there? Hi. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Well, what? Tell me a little bit about what uh, Mennonite girls can cook. Uh, I understand that this started out as uh, basic as a as a blog, and yeah. it kind of grew from there. It did. Um, it started out, I think, in 2007 or 2008. Uh, Lavella Schallenberg um, is a woman, a Mennonite woman, out in BC who had recently retired. wasn't too sure what to do with her time, and her kids were sort of teasing her about starting a a cooking blog. And she thought, oh. That's a good idea, actually, and, mm-hmm. and so started it, and, and through that met uh, about 10 other women who all started becoming c- contributors together. Mm-hmm. Um, the blog really, really took off. It has something like 3,000 hits a day, and uh, Herald Press, which is a local, um, they're actually based in Kitchener-Waterloo, had heard about this. Mm-hmm. They're a Mennonite press, and they approached the girls and said, could we put this together as a cookbook? And... So that's what we're selling now. The cookbook came out in May. It has sold like crazy. I have. I was actually not able to get a copy to buy to bring home for a good <laughs> and, and two and a half. And, and don't you work at the store? <laughs> yeah, because even because I like we put out. We'd get forty copies. We'd put them out on the front counter, and they would be gone. Wow. It, we've just sold a ton of this cookbook, and two of the women, Lovella, the woman who originally started the whole project, and another of the contributors, Annalise Friesen, are going to be in town. Uh, next Saturday and doing an event at the store to promote the cookbook. What kind of uh, what kind of stuff will be there? What uh, what what will happen? Will there be cooking demonstrations or will it be uh, we're going to have some food samples on food samples. Uh, available mm-hmm. um, that are recipes from the cookbook. Uh, myself and Caroline, another one of the staff members at the store, we we're really the big cooks at the store, and so we've been going through and arguing over who's going to cook what <laughs> at the cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been trying lots of recipes out on my family. It's a really great book. It well, give us an example of some. I mean, I mean, one of the things that caught my eye when I was reading through some of the material that this started with a what was called what is called a pasca recipe, which I guess is a is a, a foreign or a, some kind of Slavic term for Easter, an Easter traditional sweet bread. Yes, it's uh, a traditional Russian Mennonite sweet bread, um, and it's got it's like a pastry that's got a lot of icing on it, and. Um, it's something that's only served uh, around Easter in the Russian Mennonite tradition. And so that's what the blog started with, was this recipe in it, and it just sort of took off from there. And you've been sampling some of these other great recipes. Yes. Uh, I Actually, um, what I've been really impressed by is that it's both got a lot of really traditional Mennonite recipes, um, like Pascha, uh, like Platz, which is sort of like a fruit pastry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got German apple pancakes, which was something that I grew up eating um, uh, only on Christmas Day. That was sort of became our family tradition in honor of my paternal grandfather's Russian and Mennonite heritage. Um, but then it's got a lot of gluten-free, more sort of modern recipes that you wouldn't necessarily expect in a Mennonite cookbook. So they're sort of taking Mennonite cooking and kind of bringing it into more of a modern era. Um, one of the recipes in here was was how to make tacos, and and not just my. <laughs> I have Mennonite four kids. tacos. I see. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I have four kids, and they love tacos. And but this shows you how to make your own taco shells. Oh, that's it marvelous! Was the, it was the easiest thing in the world. It was like making crepes. Uh, proceeds to, uh, to this uh, book sales are going to uh, a, a charity. I understand. Yes, 
um, one of the things that the, all of the girls decided together was that they didn't need money from the royalties of this cookbook. So they're dedicating um, every year to a different charity. And this year, the first year of the cookbook, it's going to the Good Shepherd Shelter in uh, Makivka. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Sorry. In, in the Ukraine somewhere. In Ukraine, yes. Um, a shelter for, for children. And how are people, uh, listeners, uh, people that are viewing us, that will be viewing this on the, on the Internet, uh, and people uh, just generally interested in food, how could they get involved? How can they participate? How can they uh, find out more about the event and when it is and tickets and all the rest of it? You can go onto our website, which is wordsworthbooks.com, and we've got a dedicated event page to promote the event. Uh, it is next Saturday, August 13th at 2.30 p.m. in the store. And they'll probably go for about an hour, hour and a half, just really a drop-in style. Uh, the girls will be there to sign cookbooks and discuss the project and uh, come and try out some food. I, I just one last question. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, what, what is your impression uh, of the sort of the essence of the food that's prepared uh, in this book that the recipes speak to? What, how would you char- characterize it? What qualities do you think it has? Well, I think it's sort of, it's sort of what I said before. I, I feel like it's taking really traditional... Um, Mennonite food, European Mennonite food, and and kind of bringing it into the modern era. Um, Some of the women who contribute to the book uh, either have celiac disease or have relatives that have celiac disease. So they're taking a lot of these traditional recipes and they're redefining them, not using flour, finding alternate ingredients so that you still have the same taste, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, but it's, it's, it's healthier or it's, or it's something that they can eat. That's great, Bronwyn. Thanks a lot for joining us. Sounds Thank like uh, sounds like it's going to be a very tasty afternoon there next yeah, Saturday. Yeah, hope to see you there. Okay, thanks. Have a great day, Andrew. That's Bye. Bronwyn Attico of Wordsworth Books, and the name of the event is Mennonite Girls Can Cook. So go to wordsworthbooks.com, and you can find out a little bit more information. Um, that sounds like a uh, sounds like a great way to uh, sort of combine again uh, supporting a local indie bookstore that are so important to uh, to to the way we live our lives uh, with our other uh, sort of alter egos I guess in, in the Mennonite sort of backgrounds that uh, Waterloo region especially is possessed of and I think very lucky to have uh, when I often travel to Toronto and places and I get to talk a little bit about uh, you know pigtails and rolled ribs and things that happen here uh, in Waterloo region that make it a, a very unique place to live. Uh, and a very unique place also to to eat. So uh, check out those events and um, support them if you can. I think that's about all the time we have for the show for this week. I want to thank Breadheads, David O'Leary, Bronwyn Attico of Wordsworth Books, and Scott Rondo of Conscious Food Festival. Please visit 570news.com for an archive of past shows, and you can follow the food show at twitter.com, 570foodshow, and read my restaurant reviews in Echo Weekly each and every Thursday. Join us next week for a visit with Waterloo's Brick Brewing Company and cookbook author Yvonne Tremblay. We're talking preserving. Remember, eat wisely and eat well. Thank you for joining us here at The Food Show, only on 570 News.